Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, tonight I am joined by this amazing human being right here, an actor, improviser, comedian, musician, artist, bon vivant, yes, uh, and man about town, mm -hmm. uh, Ross Bryant. <laughs> yes. Ross, wel welcome to the channel. Rambler, gambler. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, my pleasure. Thank, thank you for the sweet introduction and thank you for having me. <laughs> well, you know, I, I Jared Logan uh, sets a high bar, so I figure I, I got to do something. Um, he, he rolls you guys out every week to such fanfare. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, he's, he's he's a master. He's done so much time in the stand-up comedy trenches that his that his now coming to the stage chops are honed to a fine edge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my partner, she she has done stage stuff too. And she almost always says that when we're watching, she's like, welcome to the stage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of Jared um, and Haunted City, um, that is that is one of the reasons I wanted to to have you on the channel to, to talk. I've been doing more video content lately and focusing it on Blades in the Dark, uh, which is what you all play on that show for people who don't know. Uh, Haunted City is a an actual play series on the Glass Cannon Network. Um, Ross is one of the cast members, incredible cast of players and, and GM um, that I've become a huge fan of and and is, have sort of become the like official uh, Blades in the Dark uh, actual play, so to speak. Oh, that's, um, that's, that's yeah, so great. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's really great. It's I mean, for a creator, it's always so wonderful to see people uh, use the tools that you've made and really dig into them. Um, but setting that aside, if I can, um, I don't know if I can, but um, imagining that I could, <laughs> it's just a, it's just a fun show. And um, so, yeah, we, we, it's become our weekly ritual. We make our charcuterie board, set up the <laughs> the screen in the kitchen and, and, and watch the show. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so, I yeah. mean, and it's always so cool. Like in the times that we are in, in, in chat watching along to, it was so cool when we started noticing you watching, um, and, and, and holding our feet to the fire <laughs> rules wise <laughs> when we, when we strayed. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's something I don't usually do on streams of my games. I try to stay out of it or, or not even like really say I'm there. Um, to, I don't want people to freak out, but, um, Jared was really sweet and we had spoken before and, and he, he really wanted to like get it right. And like check in and like are, did we do that right are we doing this right and josephine too is like really oh, like yeah, yeah. always like hitting me like okay what is it this or that <laughs> so and and with people in chat um there's like a new crop of folks that are learning the game right uh and are very excited about it so i kind of broke my own rule and said okay i will i will say yes that was correct no that wasn't correct mm -hmm. and, um but i think that's important to show and something i love about your group um i'd love to get your your insight into this but watching it from the outside, it, it's a very good example of a good role play principle and something that's in Blades in the Dark specifically, um, which is you don't need to get it right every time. The game builds over time. You learn through the process of play. And yeah, you didn't take that bonus die or whatever. Like that kind of stuff doesn't matter very much. Um, sometimes it, it'll be pivotal in some way, but I think it's more important to kind of like give yourself permission to just mess around and yeah, you'll figure it out later. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lower stakes, you know? Yeah. We, I totally feel that in the way in the design and um, I'm just really lucky to having like the, the cast is very supportive and, and good at, at, at uh, um, applying good role-playing <laughs> principles, which are often yes. just good, like any sort of collaborative creative principles and uh, Jared is also just such such a master at like running a game while very gently teaching you the game, <laughs> and uh, and this this game is like is like yeah like he keep the, your game keeps revealing kind of new facets of itself like even however long like however many months in um, and and as Jared kind of ups the difficulty, we start to realize these these the new, <laughs> like once we really once we got like thirteen episodes in, and we really began contending with the whole concept of tier. It really made made everything <laughs> a lot more more uh, more crouchy. And it's really fun that you as you start like you can lean if you're if you're this type of uh, fan of role playing games, you can lean so much on on the mood and the character and and just the the vibes of it. And you can totally coast on that um, as you pick up all the 
all the little um, crunchy quirks that the game has. And and uh, now I feel like they're pretty chugging along in good balance and we're not screwing things up as much as we were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And I, and I tried to put those crunch bits in places that empower the player characters. So you have a reason, like like when like you said, when you started out, maybe things weren't so dire necessarily. Some of the early situations were kind of dire, but mm -hmm. um, as things escalated and you were kind of reaching, like, what can we do? Is there anything that can help us? Then those pieces of crunch are kind of waiting there saying like, oh, yeah, you can use this little subsystem or, you know, you, remember to spend your stress this way. Remember to resist this way. Do yeah, a yeah, action, yeah. yada, yada, yada. That stuff is a bunch of details that if you don't use them, it the game is fine. Totally. You're, you're missing out on kind of like say more safety perhaps or more power um but if you don't need to reach for those at the beginning then uh the the level of complexity can be dialed way down i think um and that's true of a lot of rpgs right, uh, right. almost at, almost all rpgs really mm -hmm. um but they're they're not always so player facing sometimes they can be kind of hidden um in the what the gm is doing yeah that is like one of the things i've started to love most about your game is how how um, empowered the players feel to contribute to the overall cr creative atmosphere of the of the play, like only at times in so many games, like um, like a session begins with the GM like kind of shuffling a stack of papers and sort of like <laughs> like flipping through. And it's like five thousand years ago, the Empire of <laughs> everyone's like okay, uh, buckle up, and and I love that, but. Um, I like I like that the that the sort of ball gets passed around the focus and um, ball gets kind of passed to everybody throughout a session and you're all like a downtime especially allows each member of each person at the table to expand the lore of the world to um, provide depth to the characters you've met um, uh, build out the consequences of things that you've done set in motion things that are going to come to haunt you later and it's not just the the, the gm fire hosing scenarios at you they're <laughs> they're just as um kind of narratively reactive as a as a player is in in games and that's one of the things i like most about it um we it, it more so than than some other games i've played it you've you all feel in it together <clears throat> yeah yeah that that was definitely a big goal um because you know it you don't always have to innovate or do something take a right turn when you design something like playing in, in the same space as other games is always fun too but with blades as we were developing it we started to notice like yeah there's there's stuff we're doing at our table that we could just sort of encode here and it's not something that everybody necessarily does and it might be kind of a different um my friend Judd likes to talk about playing a bunch of RPGs like like CrossFit. Uh, <laughs> and when you do that one exercise you've never done before, you do kettlebells or whatever, you suddenly realize, oh, wait, I don't have these muscles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I thought I, I thought I had well, was a fitness guru. Or I do tons like, of oh, CrossFit. Man, so this, never... this really tracks with me. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never done it. This is an album <laughs> I grasp. But no, I, I, I am obviously a kind of a beefy a muscle head. And um, but, yeah. I, but I, I, I am like actually sort of a gym rat now. But so this actually, but though not CrossFit. -y, but yeah, totally. Like I um. Uh, like I, I played a game last week where it had that, had that moment where it was like, whoops, really <laughs> neglected something pretty profound early on. And, um, so, but yeah, uh, yeah, it, that, 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 that element of like everybody feeling empowered and, and everybody and it feeling really, really collaborative is a unique thing that I really vibe with in, in, in plays in the dark it's fun to see you all do it uh obviously you're all performers and i really want to talk about that more um because i think it's a, very important um but there a line that I, I had in the book that i ended up cutting um for the players it said it's kind of like each of you is a gm and you just have one npc um and then one of you is a gm that has a, all the rest of the npcs <laughs> um yeah because that's kind of how you play the game but I realized that that was going to like intimidate people who didn't want to be GMs um, and also like maybe confuse the issue. But watching you all do it um, and I've watched you GM a couple times now on other streams mm -hmm. and 
I can see that manifesting. And same with Jared and, um, you know, people who are GMs, uh, when they play Blades, tend to play, I think, it, with that mentality. Like, oh, this is one of my guys, and I'm going to do stuff with this guy. And, oh, if something happens to him, ah, whatever. Right. Um, well, especially with you on Haunted City. We, we're probably going to have some spoilers for Haunted City in this <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Uh, just warning everybody out there, if you're not caught up, uh, definitely go and watch season one. It's mm-hmm. wonderful. Um, that's your spoiler warning. Um, uh, you're up to four characters. Yeah, uh, counting counting Canute. Uh, <laughs> counting Canute. Yes, um, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Celiac Canute. Um, um, Eka Pragwody and uh, and now the Gestalt <laughs> being of Ekphelia. <laughs> yeah, Ekphelia. Wow, that's well. Maybe we should just talk about that right now because I don't want to forget. Because um, this is this is one of the cooler things I've seen at a, at a game table. Um, you know, there's a million ways to play the instrument, and it's pr- very rare. I I can think of maybe a couple times in my career of gaming from. In the 40 years of gaming is my that's that's my that's my timeline Whoa. a couple times this has happened um so i i would count as very rare and and you did it with with ekphelia so to speak <laughs> Ek, Ek, ophelia and ekaprag um uh yes that is the character's name uh Ek- everybody uh-huh. um randomly generated by roll 20 thank you very much <laughs> yeah um the name too too much of a mouthful <laughs> not to use <laughs> it's so good yeah um but Ophelia was an NPC, um, Joe's character's lover, uh, deceased lover. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only d- in Blades do you already have this kind of we're all kind of co GMing a little bit, uh, then you literally like stepped in and took on this NPC in scenes when that needed to happen. Uh, and then not only did that NPC become a PC, which is a thing that happens sometimes, but they became a gestalt new third character, yeah. <laughs> um, which is just so rare and wonderful. Uh, I love, I, I, yeah. I love how, like, what was that like? That like going from I'm going to play Ophelia to against Josephine in scenes, and to like fully st- stepping through the mirror there into in, um, as a character. I mean, it's just it. I mean, it's in as much as these games kind of like allow you to have this in your game in particular allows you to have this kind of expansive dramatis personae um <laughs> not only the ones that you get to kind of inhabit but like even on the sheet you've got your allies and um and nemeses and and so you are you do have you feel this like um authorship uh over over so many aspects of it but um and in, in, in a way, like, and it's, I love like the light touch with which the characters are kind of uh, brought in so that, like you say, it's an instrument that anybody can pick up and play a little bit differently. And I love, at first, I look at the character sheet of Blades and I'm like, oh, you, there's five allies or whatever. That seems kind of limiting. Um, and then it's like, oh, wait, no. It now that I've played it for like however many years, it's like, it's so rad that we have this very distinct um, flint, the phys- or sawtooth, the physiker. That's a that's a really a really clear character in our world, and I love that. It, like a, a dozen other tables, that's a completely different um, and just as fully realized uh, character. Um, so, so in a way, like so, um, Ophelia, who is this kind of like background lore character in joe's story that we learned just kind of like a couple of bullet points about it was cool to just kind of take those in the same way that you'd have just like a couple of words of description on the sheet characters you can kind of like pick that up and run with it and because everyone supports it that becomes the reality of it and then the rules of the the spoilers the vampire rules (laughs) of the book um, uh, which we kind of stumbled into totally by accident um um, when, when this ghost had inhabited this other player character for a while, it's like, oh, there are consequences here. What does that look like? And just, and yeah. Who, who, who realized like, was it you or Jared or that went, wait a minute, Ekaprag's been possessed for too long. So yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> I, think, I think Jared clocked it first and I was like, uh, yeah, Jared definitely clocked it and was like, you should look up the vampire rules. <laughs> it's like, ooh, <laughs> excellent. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so then you get to take this character that you've seen just to, just kind of like in in flashbacks or just kind of like mentioned, who's just kind of been this off off stage presence, and 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 bring them on and and uh, with all the with all the gifts of the of the rule set of, of vampirism, and show that like like any good tale of someone dabbling in life and death like ooh yes that you can bring someone back but it won't be the same yeah 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 i i i've been really enjoying your reactions and the the way you're relishing all of the little details of the vampire sheet um it's it's fun to watch your face when oh. you kind of go oh wait a minute <laughs> it's so fun um. <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's um. oh god it's so cool um cuz cuz i mean it, we obviously got started streaming with Jared playing tons of, and, and Abu playing uh, Vampire the Masquerade. And um, yeah, so we've been steeped in this whole, like that, that game of about vampires was our vampires. Mine in particular was especially tortured. And in this very, like this, um, this relationship with vampirism that was, that was in incredibly conflicted and full of moody pathos. And I liked it. Mm -hmm. And I like it. So it's nice. Um, playing a vampire that's dead and loving it <laughs> to coin <call> the <your> <laughs> yeah i i played a ton of vampire too and i love it um and my friend paul riddle he has an amazing game called undying which if you've played vampire you definitely should check it out it's Ooh. really it's like the, the vampire game for people who played a bunch of vampire and want something new cool um uh and those that that type of vampire is one that i love and but i've just seen a lot um the kind of heroic character mm -hmm. you know in a sense a lot of people play vampire in a heroic vein um even if they're tragic heroes um so when it came to making the blades vampire i was like no i think i think you're good it's not good yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, not a good yeah. thing <laughs> um, it's like the characters are uh, already um uh scoundrels so they mm -hmm. can so if it's a an even a darkening even of that um yeah well it's cool too i i liked in there's an episode in, in in blades for people who don't know when the vampire your your trauma is maxed out it's kind of this like permanent um harm that you can never heal from and psychological harm uh and when you're a vampire you have four permanent type trauma uh conditions that you choose from and they're various uh bad things <laughs> um <laughs> tortured expressions you know uh ba bad behaviors um and you have to pick four of those and when you embody those things that's one of the ways you get xp and I, joe and abu hadn't read into it and didn't really know the vampire thing was coming and the way you were acting i think there was a couple moments where they were like damn you're jesus this is not cool yeah yeah <laughs> like not like in character out of character they were really loving it but i think they were kind of shocked their characters were kind of shocked um and it, it was a nice moment a sort of meta reveal of like yes i i did this cool performance of this character and then here here's sort of the notes that the director gave me <laughs> yes exactly um, yeah. that, that's why i made these decisions in the scene uh right right that was it was fun to see that yeah it that's one of my favorite things about this is like it's it's that that just the light touch of inspiration that allows you to that just kind of sets your sets your course um it, it's it's just a little a little seed that you that you all sprout imaginatively together and yeah so but yeah like so yeah you pick whatever it is like secretive obsessed vicious ruthless whatever these these trauma conditions <laughs> are and it's like okay what would a how would a character behave operating under all those <laughs> constraints? <laughs> Be a dang maniac, folks. <laughs> it's a, a delight uh, to be unleashed. Yeah. And I also appreciate that Abu especially, um, but also Joe to some degree, instantly were like, this is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is really great. It's another aspect of gaming that I think Haunted City cast and, J and Jared as uh, the GM do such a good job with, which is key, you know, and again, I think this might be part of your experience as performers. Um, there's the play of the characters and then there's the, the play of the people. Yeah. And there is, there is a separation there. So you can go hard in character in various ways. You can betray, you can 
you know, do this, the wrong thing, make horrible decisions, et cetera, et cetera. And everyone is loving it. Oh yeah. And role play falls on its face sometimes when that isn't happening well, when, when an in, in character behaviors and are seen as like not optimal or, you know, we're like, we need to maximize our effectiveness as a team and stuff like that. Um, which is fine. Like some games you kind of need to, cause that's the way they're built. But, um, totally. And, and of course that stuff can be toxic. I'm not like giving carte blanche to people to be dicks, uh, in character. Right, right. But, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that I'm a big fan of. And, um, especially characters that don't have their own best interests at heart. You know, the Jimmy McNulty's of the world, the, the people that are, they're just, they're going to ruin the things for themselves. They're almost and, enemies. Yeah. I love, yeah. I love that stuff also. And, and I'm, I'm totally like, I'm probably why I vibe with this so much is that's totally my sweet spot. I like, I like characters that are narratively optimized, not like, yes. um, not, um, mechanically optimized. So, um, so playing games that are all about like kind of uh, granular strategy, though I do enjoy them. It's just not my, it's not my, my, like, my sweet spot where I feel in the pocket and like, because I, I, am, I often feel like I'm dumb and I've made like the wrong choice. Um, whereas <laughs> like, there's no wrong choices when you tell a story. So, uh, yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love that about that, but, and that comes down to the, the system is kind of built to facilitate that, um, or to facilitate interesting narrative choices that you win, not necessarily when a score goes successfully, but you win when interesting things happen. And, uh, and though, though it's though I, it is, I'd rather be successful. Um, <laughs> and, but, and like you say, the, the, the in-character conversation and the meta conversation, um, is, is something that, may, that it's just people work, can work on that level of communication of like, what is your investment with the character? Hey, you, you, your character betrayed me. And I took that personally. It take, takes some, some just relational finesse to, to be like, Hey, we've got these two modes. Um, what's it, it, almost every, like, almost every, like my game isn't working subreddit <laughs> thread is yes. like, just talk to each other, <laughs> like have a, yes. have a conversation and be on the same page about what you want out of this. And and when everybody is has that same pagedness, then things tend to go well. And so the yeah. problems are just break down with like people's communication styles clashing. Um, but like you say, my some of my favorite moments in this game are when something totally demented is happening that's going to be terrible for our characters. And in the other four quadrants of the grid on the stream, it's all of us like, hooray, <laughs> like, <laughs> we're all going to die. <laughs> like, uh, it's, uh, Me too. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And the, like you were saying, the, the player, the person to person thing trumps everything. Like yeah. we, we don't necessarily need to hash out how your character betraying mine made me feel really bad. I mean, we should talk about it, but we also are allowed to just say, no, I don't want that to happen in the game. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you get to play your character and make decisions, but I don't want you to betray me. It makes me feel bad. And we can just go, okay, cool. I won't then, yeah, <laughs> you know, the fiction is nothing. It's just, if, if right. it's a, it's ether. And so like, just let it go and do something else. And it, it's totally fine. And same thing with anything else in a game. Like we've had sessions where, uh, we played a whole session of a game and at the end of it went, that sucked. Let's play next week as if this did none of this happened. We'll just go back to where we were and do it, it again. I love that um, you just why not? made a little pocket dimension and it can float off and be, be its own weird little thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Totally fine. It's totally fine. You don't have to put th that that kind of pressure on it. Um, One thing you said I wanted to circle back to um, about uh, the, the sort of um, your characters being invested in in good things and victory but you and the rest of the players being invested in interesting things mm -hmm. as the kind of currency. Um, something else I've noticed, uh, particularly with Haunted City, is how dice results, um, you're all you're doing the traditional gamer thing, you know, where you're just like, ah, come on, come on, we really need that good roll. Right. And you're invested in it. But once the number comes up, I see very clearly, I feel like you, this group models this behavior very well. A lot of people do it, but, um, this, 
it's almost like you've gotten your 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 improv scene prompt or something and you go okay yeah i i got a one now i know how to play this i got a four okay now i know how to play this instead of kind of like ah there's nothing i can do now i i i'm stuck here and i i needed to win and you know it's just you're you're invested and excited to hit that six but when the one pops up i i see it sometimes this little like check in with yourself or, mm -hmm. or abu or joe kind of go like Mm, okay and yeah, like i yeah. know how to play this absolutely uh, like i mean that's you're you're speaking my language when you reference the the improv prompt of it that's that's precisely <laughs> it it's like oh okay great yeah um i can roll with that what's what does this mean uh uh how are how are we all going to react um <laughs> emotionally to this this situation now that it's gone belly up um and then that's 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 fun so many of the so many of the cool threads that have developed have come from the failures and the struggles. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of makes you bulletproof, right? Because yeah. like you said, it's about being interesting and interesting turns of this tale. So once you're in that mode, there is no, like you, you, like I said, you care about the dice and you do want your characters to succeed, but there's no result that that's is, is bad for you. <laughs> the, right. The, the person. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And especially um, in, in, especially in a situation like where if that person goes down hard, you got two or three other people waiting in the wings that you can uh, pull their sheet out of the out of the filing cabinet and, and get them back in play. Uh, that is one of my that's may, maybe my favorite thing about this is that you like as I you know greedily am into this for like the perf performery narrative stuff. It's like oh well, I get to play more than one character. That's 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 great. Um, and then we get to have like moments like we've had in the show where like whole scenes happen. <laughs> Where one person is kind of uh, doing their their one person show while everyone else is like munching popcorn. <laughs> Those are always so tricky to do, and you know sometimes you just got to do it. You got to yeah, talk yeah. to yourself. I try to minimize it as much as possible, but I like how the pieces of the show have moved around now. Where there's, you know, while one of Joe's characters is talking to one of your other characters, one of your other characters is talking to her other character, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's enough separation now where it's not just. You, you to yourself uh right, and, right. um those moments have been really satisfying and and then the sub story with chuck and the other gang and um i was actually uh i was talking to allison uh, my partner about um like oh, i think i'm gonna pitch to glass cannon uh to see if maybe they want me to run blades as a one shot or something i'm gonna pitch uh running chuck's crew to oh them, yeah see if they want no, <laughs> and and that was like before you before you guys did it <laughs> So that was announced, and I was like, "Ah, shit. Okay, maybe I'll pitch. Uh, maybe I'll pitch uh, Celiac's uh, cult. Yeah, <laughs> and see if they want to do that as a, as a one shot." For, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of a lot of players on the board. <laughs> Bring some new folks in. Oh, that'd be great. But yeah, like I love that. Like that's one of the things I love most about these games, where even the losses are in their own way wins. Where you get to, um, you, yeah, you just it just opens up potential for for something uh uh for something interesting to happen i mean that is like the very narrative like playwritery screenwritery thing about this game is like stories aren't like introduce your hero and then it's a series of successes culminating in triumph <laughs> it's you introduce your hero and then terrible things happen to them for 90 minutes to two hours and with occasional triumphs and then they and then maybe succeed or maybe and tragically at the end so it's it's fun to not be so hyper powered that you're that you're just like um i've crafted the perfect uh strategic response <laughs> to this situation and your attack is nullified and i i have <laughs> defeated your game sir um, <laughs> good day yes yeah i well and i think um in that sense that there's there's these like modalities uh, like the author and the performer um you know flipping back and forth sometimes uh or like constantly really um, you're, you're authoring the game with the other people at the table, you're performing your character, um, and are in, in them. Uh, but for me, especially author mode is like, I spend a little more time there, I think. And because of that, I'm always excited to like make another character, create more stuff, introduce more story. Um, I got a million blades in the dark characters. Oh, yeah. And I don't have time in my life to play them all. Mm -hmm. So with if this person dies or goes to prison or whatever, that's great. It gives me a chance to bring in the next <laughs> the next right, guy. Right. Um, oh. So it's an opportunity um, in a way. Um, yeah. 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 
that's that's like so many of your you have like in the book you have that list of like good player practices and gm practices and just like i i've done oh i'm been in the improv trenches for a long time and almost all of them are like are just rewordings or straight up what we say like to facilitate good uh, group dynamics and and that's that's it you're just like you see these mistakes as opportunities to, to weave them into the larger pattern if something if something totally. happens that 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 seems like discordant how do you how do you kind of reframe it um or uh, or, or play the note that makes brings it back into harmony or whatever <laughs> yeah 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 well i mean uh speaking of that like mu musical improv uh which you also do it is a yeah. whole other <laughs> kettle of fish um yeah. an incredible magic trick that we uh, we've enjoyed watching um so much uh that that has been a wonder to dive into more deeply oh, cool. with the stuff you've done on dropout and also um zach and jess's show yeah uh, yeah uh podcast um off book the musical it's sure. definitely check it out folks at home um but that that's like another layer uh, to the whole to to improvisation, obviously, right? Like mm -hmm. because of the music. But in watching that, and and in watching the um, improvised Shakespeare Company folks on on Game Changer, um, you know, it it felt like a high wire act. You know, it it's improv in in and of itself is kind of magical to watch. Um, but then having the extra layer of the language, which is so in your bones now, I mean, you, you've been in that company for yeah. a long, long, long time, time. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, you know, that language does get into you. I, I remember when I was like really, really into Shakespeare, I would, it, it would just sort of come out of me totally. you, know, you can you can get into that mode mm -hmm. or, or, or any kind of thing, um, you know, 1920s period, right. uh, old timey talk or, or whatever it is. I remember I read like an Irvin um, Welsh book, like read train spotting. And then for like two weeks, mm, your inner, yep. your inner voice is just all like Scottish brogue because <laughs> it's, it's like written phonetically. Yeah. Yeah. You can just, you can yeah. look it up and absorb it, but I, I go on. Yeah, I, I, I'm losing the thread of the music thing now for some reason, but um, uh, improv, yes, musical improv. Oh, oh, the discordant note and, oh, yeah. and, and weaving that in. Um, yeah, I think that's really good. The, the, the player practices and blades definitely come from a lot of hard one experience over a long time playing role playing games. I've studied improv a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not surprised that they have a lot in common. Yeah. I, my, my friend, Karen 12 has an amazing book, improv for gamers. Oh, cool. Just, she's an improv uh, teacher and she's essentially like done that. She's taken oh, wow. those classic improv skills and, um, written them f for gamers to use and with exercises and all that kind of wow. stuff. So, um, I do think that is an area that gamers in general, you know, don't always, um, think about as part of their skill set. Uh, and I, I don't think you need to be a performer to play role-playing games obviously that's one of their great benefits is that they're very accessible to any any skill set of, yeah. of person and i think like um, i have nothing but, and even if you're not like I, I i don't know i'd recommend even like reading one of those books or taking a workshop or whatever i, I don't know you don't you don't have to but like one it's fun but like even if you're not the sort of person that's like wants to do accents like you don't have like <laughs> even if it doesn't inflect your performance of a character at all even if you are the sort of person who loves to like do it all like as a narrator like they they go over here like yeah this the the soft skills of improvisation just of like i hear someone's idea how can i build on that how can i weave the thing you created into the thing that i'm imagining and make it how can i make our collective imaginative project make the things in it more important and keep weaving in elements that came in earlier um, just, just, and, and to approach the games with the attitude of group support. Um, and, uh, and also the, what we were just talking about that improv is so much about like Del Close, Lord love him, uh, uh, father of improv and, uh, famous, uh, uh, drug addict and problematic person had a, um, had a, uh, uh, like wear your character, like a straw boater, like lightly where it's like you, uh, you yes. play it. But the audience always sees you underneath kind of like so 
improv is always operating in a gear of like kind of getting lost in the sauce of the character, but also like me, the performer having a conversation, a meta conversation, both with the, the other players and sometimes the audience. Um, uh, yes. And, and that's like, and th- all those gears, while they're not like, if, even if you're not the sort of person who wants to like take a swing at, uh, take a swing at a French accent in your game, like all that <laughs> stuff is so helpful just for like group play. Yes, very much so. I love that that's phrase. I hadn't heard that before. Um, my friend Avery says, drive your character like a stolen car, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, which is a different uh, take, <laughs> but um, a, a kind of recklessness, which, yeah. I, love, which I like. Don't be so um, precious. About yeah, it. don't be so precious. And I, I like this idea that there is this kind of winking quality to it, that you are suspending disbelief in the audience to some degree, e- even on a stage where you're saying like, oh, we sure are lost on in this submarine with, a, with no sets or anything. Um, but having that winking quality where we're, we're kind of like, I know that you're not really buying it, mm-hmm. but it's funny or, or interesting or dramatic or whatever it is. Um, that's one of those things. I just, I, I think we've said it a bunch of different ways now, like having that ability to kind of always be a little bit out and not fully like stuck inside this, the, the problem at hand or whatever it is. And just kind of always keeping one foot with the other people at the table and just kind of like being very present with them yeah Um, yeah and i mean that's the i mean any improv teacher would be like the most important thing is listening and that's yeah that's that's it like something you said when you're talking to brennan on on adventuring academy is um improv being the art of making things important mm -hmm. uh you grabbing onto whatever's there even if it's silly or discordant or you rolled the one or whatever Yeah, yeah you go okay i I, this is important now and I'm going to, I'm going to turn it into something. Um, I, I love that phrase. Right. That was, that was good. I, yeah. That, that's, that's the whole thing. Like some, some odd uh, I was really impressed when I was like taking classes in Chicago with like friends of mine or in, in teachers or whatever, were like in the first two lines of a scene or three lines of a scene. So it was like really already kind of propulsive. And I was like, Oh, like often what they're doing is just like, no matter what is in those first couple lines, like, you just choose to care a lot about like whatever that is. Um, yeah. It's like, Oh, right. Like um, if, if things are going right, it's usually cause you're kind of kicked back with this sort of like apathetic coolness. Um, mm-hmm. And like, uh, and it, which is, which is a different kind of like detachment than what we're talking about of like having kind of a director brain that's outside of the performer brain, like watching everything. Um, yeah. So yeah. Like whatever happens, like make it, make it super duper important. Like, so, uh, I'm trying to think of like, um, I mean, and, 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 and Josephine and, and Abu and Jared just do it. So, so brilliantly. Um, so well, that's something that we've tried to solve from the game design side to some degree. Um, you know, obviously these skills take long time to develop. Well, not a long time to, to gain the first rung on the ladder yeah, yeah. and make them useful. Um, but you all been doing it for a long time and, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, anybody can do this. Just, you know, take a class. Uh, <laughs> but, um, there, there is like a, a short run up to having some of those skills come on board pretty early, totally. which I think is great. Um, but from the game design side, we've tried to take some of those lessons, um, and sort of encode them. Um, I learned a lot from my friend Vincent and Meg Baker. They made a game called apocalypse world among many others, um, brilliant game designers and one of the great features of that game that really taught me this lesson is this idea of making fit characters, uh, which is essentially a way of saying that there's a situation in this case, it's the apocalypse you're surviving in a community of people with the other PCs, um, and some other folks, um, you have pressing concerns of sort of day to day survival, plus like strange psychic shit that's happening that people don't understand. Um, and through the process of making your characters, you fit them the character creation procedure fits them into that in an inextricable kind of way so that their immediate concerns goals drives character traits are attached to the setting the premise the other the npcs the factions right and you kind of can't come into a session and say like well i don't know what i want to do or have the gm say 
so you guys are in the town of Felgarden. What do you want to do? And everyone kind of looks at each other. Um, yeah, yeah. That kind of character creation, if if someone isn't overseeing it and making it all do the work, you can have character creation that sort of dumps this imp character out in a place where they like, I don't know, I, I'm good at casting spells. That's kind of what I know about them. Um, and Apocalypse World and, and others, Vampire, I think also does this pretty well too, like enmeshing you in those things. Um, so with Blades, I sort of, sort of try to take those lessons and say like, yeah, you make a bunch of decisions when you make your character, but you make all these decisions when you make the crew too. Who did you pay off? Who did you not pay off? Who do you owe? Who who hates you? Who likes yeah, yeah, you? Yeah. Um, and just by doing that, you can't start from zero. You're, you have all this momentum when the game starts. Um, that's kind of what I was hearing when you were saying like, just latch on to those first things in a scene and go be like, yes. Right, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run. Um, because there's nothing worse than, especially a game that has like somewhat tedious um, character creation, um, <laughs> doing your taxes kind of mm -hmm, character creation, mm -hmm. um, that then dumps you out with, what do you wanna do? Um, that that can be that can be really game killing, and I, I I see it happen less and less because I think the community as a whole is kind of like realize that that's a big problem, um, and developed various uh, ways to get around it. But um, I think that's a place where game designers can take some responsibility and build processes into that those initial stages of the game so that you end up with those gears, you know, yeah, yeah, clicked clicked together. I I feel like I've yeah I've experienced both not like. Or, or at least I've experienced the design as a participant where like, as it goes on, I'm like, oh, I really have my hands around like what this character is going for, what they, what they want, what their vibe is. And, and cause yeah, like being able to answer that question, what do you, what do you want? What do you want to do? That's like kind of, that's kind of everything. So yeah, um, if you have, once, once you got that, you, you have the, you got the, you got the gas, you get the juice, baby. Um, that's kind of why I, I'm against, not against like, you know, as an ideology, but I don't prefer like backstory per se. I, I think you need something, you need to know where you've come from and know something about the character, but that the thing that's most press, you know, they, they've come home and there's a stranger dead in the kitchen. Like that is worth so much, probably more than the fact that we know that they we're raised Catholic and, you know, have a Honda. Right. Um, right. <laughs> like that, that situation in the house is, is everything. And, um, those are extreme examples, but I think that's kind of where my mind goes. Like I, I kind of want to get into the character as a, something being propelled forward. Yeah. Not necessarily expressing who they are because until it's on screen, it, so to speak, it, they, they're, they're not anybody. Right. Um, right. I mean, they, or they, or they could, could be anyone. Totally. And I, I, I like coming up with characters, but like, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I, what I, one of the things I love about Blazing the Dark is it does kind of put you on the front foot like that. And your, your character, even at the end of like filling out the sheet, though, you have a grasp about like their vibe and everything. Like, like the character creation is a process of discovery in the game. Um, not, yes. not one that you, that you are doing, you're not like writing your, your tome of character lore, um, beforehand. And I, and I, cause that's, that is so much of the fun of it for me. Maybe even the most fun is, is seeing where like the guy that the, the person that started in, in session one has grown and twisted and, and changed by episode 10. Um, yeah, we, like, we know them from that. It's, it's the old, the screenwriting adage, you know, characters are, are their actions. Uh, and that's why they're called actions in Blaze in the Dark, not skills because you're, uh. you're, you're doing these things and by doing by expressing these actions we come to find out who you are right. and it's almost a i mean it can be interesting to know that the gunslinger is a defrocked priest like okay yeah that's an interesting thing to know mm -hmm. um it's not that there's no space for background details or anything but um what do they do now what's what what do we see them do what line will they not cross? Who will they betray? Who will they not betray? How do they solve problems? You know, are they clever? Are they violent? Do they change over time? Do they realize that violence doesn't work? Do they realize being clever doesn't work? You know, all those things yeah, are yeah. stuff that we get to see and do. Um, right. Not just write it as a, 
as a background. Yeah, and that's like, I mean, yet again, one of the reasons this like is so simpatico with the 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 improv world is that's like exactly what you do there too. It's like you don't come in like I have the full set of I have the character <laughs> integrity of this thing. I'm going to step into the scene and I will maintain this rigidly. Um, no, you you go in totally. You go in completely open, and characters are created by like everybody saying things, and you're just being like, yep. Yeah, that also is true. I I am that. Uh, but and but then like, it's not just the acceptance. It's the like, why is that important to me? Why is that like the thing that motivates me? Why? Um, what else have I done because that is true? Um, it's, um, yeah, like it's a series of if then statements. <laughs> um, all, <laughs> yeah, all the totally. way to the end. When you're doing um, improv Shakespeare Company, um, do you? It, I, it's the it's a improv format, right? You're getting prompts and yeah, wh- wh- doing that kind of thing. Wh- but what we've got on that, I, know, I mean, this is probably over explaining, but like if, if people have seen the on uh, Dropout, we've done an episode of that Game Changer show. And that's that's pretty close to what we do. Like we don't we, we only get one suggestion in our show show. We get a title. OK. And then and then we do the sh- that's what I was we wondering. Do the play for 90, 90 minutes. OK, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's what I was wondering, because. It seemed like the like the level of effort for Game Changer, because there were so many prompts, and it was like, okay, now you got to do this, now you got to do this, now you got to do this. And I was like, man, how do you do that for a ninety minute stage show? That seems like it would just having so many prompts would be yeah, the hard to manage. Uh, in a way, like he was like the gift of that show is like kind of showing the challenge for any like improv on camera is like does it, can you translate a theatrical medium to a screen medium? And part of that is like, how do you maintain, sell to the audience that it is made up on the spot? Cause even, mm, even mm-hmm. in a stage, like, which as an improviser is like, you don't think that was really in what universe, <laughs> but like, um, but like the prompts help to convey that like, yes, this is all being come up with in the moment, but like playing kind of meta games like that, that those prompts enforce is what we do in the show anyway. Like someone, mm. it, but instead of it coming up externally, just in the in the course of us like riffing, someone would randomly say something uh, that 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 opens up a, a, uh, a bank of like cultural reference. And then, sure, and then, right. And then a sort of like meta game that we begin playing with each other like organically is like, Okay, someone someone rep, someone mentioned uh, someone said trailblazer, and then someone said bulls. Uh, so <laughs> so in this scene, we're gonna we're gonna we might have the challenge. A pattern's been established organically. Mm-hmm. We're gonna try to maintain the integrity of this scene, but we're gonna try to name every NBA team, <laughs> like yes, um, or, totally, or whatever. Totally. Like that's that's not gonna happen in every scene, or maybe even every show. But like pattern patterny things like that occur in it that's really fun because it's it's again one of those like uh interior to the character but also actor is playing this meta game having this this meta conversation with the with the other players well and i i would assume that your your uh pattern seeking um skill set gets gets honed to a fine point where you're you're out there with all these eyes on you and you need you need to grab onto something to make this to make it go so anything that looks like a pattern um even if only one person sees it that it's you're you're just always ready to kind of like oh yeah just pounce it's like red, grab onto red that. meat it's ch- chum in the water when that <laughs> when, when something like that pops up it's it's great great fun yeah yeah um yeah your 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 head is always on a swivel for that for that kind of stuff um yeah it's all yeah it yeah because because it's all like I mean, some teachers you have would just say it's like almost all patterns. It's like your your character mm. is playing out patterns of behavior. There's there's the meta there, there's the speech patterns that they that create their their method of conveying ideas, and then you've got these like meta meta reference patterns. The sh- the show itself, like oh, we did two short scenes in a row. Maybe this show is all thirty second scenes, or like mm-hmm. like you're paying attention to like the formal structure of a show, and that is a set of patterns. Like. Um, but and it just depends on what the group wants to do yeah so yeah that's fascinating stuff it's 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 the kind of thing that i 
I, I'm, I'm a big media consumer, uh, sponge, you know, um, always have been. And I'm like really into, uh, how things get made. You know, I like to get, dig into, um, film production and screenwriting and all this, the, the creative minds behind, um, the stuff. And, um, that it's always fascinating for me to see the, the process and see the creative, um, um, vision but i really like uh art forms that where you can see the structure kind of live you know and i think improv and especially sort of themed improv the shakespearean stuff that you do mm -hmm. um it's almost it's almost like especially if you know the source material um you it, as a as someone who loves process and and everything it's you can almost see it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the see the pattern happen and then see someone break it and then see the the random thing that sparks this that we never would have seen coming and um it's it's like watching the the director's commentary while you're watching the thing almost in a yeah, way you know? yeah right, um, right. yeah yeah it, it, i love that it's it's so cool to to see the wheels turning and the at the same time like keeping the performance going right. keeping the plate i feel like um, the best spinning. the best shows have 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 a good balance of both because like a show that's all the the crunch of like the the conversation like did you really are we we're like <laughs> like um yeah i think those those shows are not propulsive <laughs> um uh -huh, and uh -huh. and i think shows that are like really clean and like in the in the care a show that almost has the energy of a one act play like sometimes are are, are fantastic are, are fantastic but i think um i feel like it, it, a good improv show has has a good balance of both like it can't be all reference game it can't be all like list list serials like and, <laughs> and it and um and i don't know that people necessarily want to see an improvised like scene study either <laughs> like there there is like yeah there, there, so i've, can, I've yeah. seen i've seen like probably i've seen good versions of both of those and i've sure, seen sure. and i've seen way more versions that are that are hard to watch mm -hmm. and i've done even more that are hard to watch <laughs> no no one no one uh no one uh gets gets through getting a lot of improv reps without being in a ton of unwatchable shows and i've i've done yeah, i've done countless think... ones <laughs> For me, like I used to live pretty close to Jet City Improv spot here in Seattle, um, and so I I went a fair amount. Um, and as a as a fan, um, that's part of the fun. You know, if you're if this is a one off thing, you go to the Kennedy Center to see your mm -hmm. troupe perform. You know, obviously, like you want you want to see a great show, and you guys you're going to be great. Um, but for the local troupe doing their stuff every week like it was it, it's fun to watch maybe a show that doesn't come together yeah um and I, well. it's got i'm sure it's painful on the stage <laughs> but um it, there, there's a kind of i don't know there's an appreciation there no to, no to, again to like see see the process and be like oh wow yeah i see how i see how this is falling apart uh -huh. um i some um, of my favorite theaters like in 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 chicago like when i was really like like in my hyper improv nerd moment of like just seeing shows all the time and doing shows all the time. Like the theaters were really cool. We're like on the same bill on the same night, you would see like something that blew your mind at the back of your head, like in insanely um, transcended and just like, like the worst, most broken um, <laughs> like thing where like nothing really gets off the ground within 20 minutes of each other um there's there's something beautiful <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah but uh yeah i think yeah yeah no go ahead but I, I i wanted to mention like and i feel like we'll walk off stage for for like uh, an improv shakespeare show for example and feel like man that was like that felt like a play it really felt like it really just felt like a play like it was so smooth like every every want was really clear like one thing like um really elegantly led to the next um it felt and i feel like we were really on fire with the language tonight and we'll notice that like the the shows that we do that are not that that feel not 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 getting into like uh really hard territory but like felt like a little more work where like where uh where the audience is definitely seeing the gears turn a little bit more and us like having to 
pull a non sequitur into shape. <laughs> like those are the ones where like audience members come up afterwards and be like, that was the one, man. <laughs> it was like, okay. I felt like I was really sweating out there, but okay. Like that's, but that's, I feel like that's part of what makes oh, it man, fun. That's something it is. I something I love about art. I, I, I tell this all the time because it's one of my favorite things. Uh, Stephen Bruce, the author has a book, um, the sun, the moon and the stars. And uh, it's about being creative. Um, kind of about being a writer, although the character in the in the story is a painter. Um, and they have this huge canvas, like eight foot by eight foot canvas that some someone gave them as a gift in art school. And they've just carted it around their whole life and never used it. And they have to use it for something special and they never want to, you know, ruin it because it's special. And they finally decide, like, I'm going to paint the big canvas. And they do this huge thing that takes forever. And um they're you know going back and putting another layer of gloss on the hand that's mm -hmm. the ray of sunlight is hitting and um there's a little a section in the in the book where the artist is talking to a friend and um the, they said you know when i do a show or something somebody will people will come up and compliment me for what i've done and um most of the time the thing that they loved the most in my work is something that i didn't really care a lot about necessarily or i didn't put a lot of effort into <laughs> it was just the gesture of the brush that day and the thing that i spent months years perfecting and making sure every dot was exactly perfect nobody mentions nobody talks about um that i, I love that idea yeah, and yeah. it's happened to me a lot uh in my creative work and um in graphic design and in, and in game design and um I think there's there, there's something that the lesson there that I take away is that it's often even when you're a performer for an audience like it's 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 got to be about you to some degree like you have to be there because you love doing it <laughs> <laughs> not because the amount of effort matches the amount of notice or acclaim or whatever like yeah, that's yeah. just not how it works and um I I think that anecdote about the show is a, is a perfect example of that. Um, yeah. The the thing that somebody loves, you just never know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah. Uh, uh, widespread acclaim and notice is not why, not, not generally what, what people get into the improv game for. <laughs> <So> <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, you're safe right out of the bat, yeah, right yeah, off the yeah. bat. Like, you're, yeah, uh -huh. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> right, right. Where, where, where maybe you're in in terms of cultural prestige, you're somewhere between like ventriloquist and like mime. Um, but like, <laughs> okay, yeah, no, acclaim, acclaim was the wrong word. No, uh, no, no, just no. I, the, the, yeah. uh, the, uh, yeah, but the the effect, I, I guess, I should I, yeah, say, course, the effect on the on the audience, yeah. 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 Um, um, <laughs> certainly not acclaim. <laughs> I mean, ga game. I think game uh, tabletop game design ranks somewhere way below improv in terms of. Uh, uh, what notoriety <laughs> i mean i i mean yeah like i feel like these are both things that like to a layman you're like when someone asks what you what you're about to what what are you what are you doing tonight it's like um how do i um <laughs> yeah you have like, to measure the like how much do i care about what you think and how long do i need this conversation right to be? right right um uh, i'm gonna play a game oh like board games yeah yep that's enough that's enough. What, what do you do i'm a graphic designer yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's like the easiest one <laughs> totally people have their hands um, yeah people grasp that game designer time. maybe uh but yeah but like uh, i gotta say though like just having i've been so lucky between uh stream of blood and glass cannon to play this wide swath of games that i would never have like just kind of on my own with with with, with buds and like yeah once you do you do begin to notice like the way the design of the thing um affects the experience of play and 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 blades is constantly referenced as being elegant and beautiful and and it truly is like it, for for what that that art form is like it is a it is an elegant piece of work well thank you for saying so i appreciate that uh it's it it, it is born out of play like long long experience of play and finally realizing that i don't know when this was you know 20 years ago or something but after struggling with game certain some game designs um really realizing like i what i need to do is is 
play the earliest prototype and try to capture what we're doing at every step of the way so that there's constantly this feedback between what the game system is doing, even if it's just like a half a page of notes. And then looking at the behaviors at the table, the outcomes, the the what characters do, what the sessions look like, and just do that over and over and over again. So you can see, you know, it's almost like running your your hot rod uh, on the quarter mile and then like tuning, okay, what I'm just gonna change this one thing with the carburetor and like run it again. Like, is that oh we actually went slower? Shit. Okay, we're going the wrong way. <laughs> um and it's almost a brute force thing. And over time you develop skills and you don't need to brute force everything. You kind of know how things are going to go to some degree, but it really is when people say elegant, it's a, I love that. That's definitely what I'm striving for. But I think it, that is born out of just kind of running it through the mill over and over and over again, or polishing the stone or whatever you want to say. Like, yeah. um, it, it, the, the act of playing it and iterating and playing it and iterating and playing and iterating over and over. We played, we did two years of that with Blaze, almost weekly sessions. Wow. Um, and so that's that's kind of what happens. I think you you inevitably kind of shave it down mm -hmm. and sneak up on it. Adam Savage always says when he's talking about his projects, you you kind of just sand it and sand it and sand it until um, it's where it should be. And you don't get all the rough edges off. Uh, at some point, you know. Um, I forget who said it, Dorothy Parker probably, that art isn't finished, it's abandoned. <laughs> uh, and that's always true. But um, yeah, if there's it, the, what elegance is there, I would attribute to that process and to the play testers that showed up every week to to be the cogs in the machine to make that happen. Yeah. But yeah, it, every, everything just seems to like fit and flow and facilitate a, a, a really enjoyable propulsive creative experience and 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 the thing that turned me and i have to be like the thing that turned me off it when i first was exposed to it which is like oh there's so much of a world here what what i feel like my mm -hmm. imagination my imagination is being pushed out because there's so mm -hmm. this is such a realized um world it's set in <laughs> every little thing has been named yeah and, yeah. yeah that like mm -hmm. that that's now become my favorite thing is that it's all like it's all just grist for the mill and the, like Oh, we get to in, we get to invent, iterate, imagine our own unique version of Duskwall that is that is its own uh, cool edifice, on uh, same but kind of unlike uh, every other groups. Um, yeah, it's so it's so that's one of my. It's not the blank page. You get you get this prompt. You get this springboard. Exactly. Yeah. The, the community aspect where people can compare notes. What's your, what's Lord Scurlock like? Yeah, like that's, yeah, yeah. that's fun. Um, but it really is about the springboards and some people, you know, they level the critique at blades kind of the other way and say like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, but there's kind of nothing to it. Like the characters, they just have like the NPCs, they have like three words that describe them. There's street names, but it doesn't really tell you like where the, where are the gang's headquarters? Like where, where's people want, like I, people have asked me like, make a lexicon or encyclopedia, you know, give us everything we want. We want all the lore. We want all the details. Oh. We want everything. And I get that as a, something you want to like have and have put on, put on your shelf and flip through and go, Oh, yeah. neat, there's a lot of stuff here. But at the table, it really is like, I, it, it's unwieldy. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't like being uh, beholden to all that. And yeah, because it, it, that's the thing that really begins to push your imagination to the side or, 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 yeah. or maybe not that it just, as a player or as a GM, that stuff makes me start to second guess because I know I'm going to have somebody at my my table where I'm like, uh, the the dragon rears his head and blows a, a waft of poison, and it's like, I'm sorry, wasn't this a purple dragon? I think they only like, um, yeah, like yeah. I, well, there, there's almost no load bearing stuff. Like if you off the cuff, if you say like, oh yeah, they're part of the hive, which is like a guild of ancient sorcerers, and like that's totally not what they are. But like, so what? Yeah. Like, it's not. Now they the, are. The, the, you said they were. So the they hive are. is not yeah. a load bearing part of the game that's going to make it all fall apart. It's it's there for you to use and riff on. But who cares? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, right. Right. I love that. I love that. Like we just get that little that just a little nugget. And then and then we have like the whole group's imaginations go to work on it and and make it and fill it out. Um, yeah, it's almost like uh there for when you have that blank page 
moment of like, exactly. oh shit, right. I don't know what I don't know what to add. You could almost just keep it closed. If if you're going and you've got this faction, that faction, you're making up NPCs, da 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 da, and you never need to flip real quick and and grab a name or grab the faction or something. If you never need to do that, pff, yeah, that's fine. There's there no, nothing will go awry. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. By doing that, you're you're not incumbent to your your tome of lore and and part of part of like, I mean, part of like group 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 improv game rpg group brain is that you remember all those details better so you don't like feel it's one thing to have your having memorized your your tome of lore but if you if we came to someone's name because we all kind of invented it and we all repeated it and then that's just in our in our bones now we have our we have yeah. our personal vocabulary like part of part yeah. of what makes these th the experience of playing these games so fun is you and in improvisation too is like it's like for one night only we will come up with in, in jokes that are just for this room of people um <laughs> and and mm -hmm. and all the lore is in a way its own kind of like narrative in joke that we're all building on and and creating together and yeah i love that i i imagine it's a, a little bit like if you've played the game multiple times, um, and this has happened with, with my various plays groups, um, it, I imagine it's similar to being an actor who has played, especially like a Shakespearean actor, like maybe you've played through the whole canon multiple times and you've been uh, Benvolio a, a handful of times, you've been Tybalt, you've been whoever, um, and the sixth time you play Tybalt you, there's still something there for you to go mm, you know what maybe he's like this yeah Tybalt's gonna be like this this time and it's not just like oh it's the same thing over and over it's the same character over and over right no it's like there's you can always find some nuance or like we were saying before like establish this pattern like Lord Skurlock is is mm -hmm. always, I, I, I love to play him this way but the fifth time you go you know what no he's gonna be this sort of simpering noble uh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> character that's just like really uh un un unthreatening and um th let's do that that'll be fun oh hell yeah 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 um yeah i totally vibe with that I, I, i'm one of those people who will like dork out watching a bunch of like a bunch of different versions of uh shakespeare on film just to like mm -hmm. for the for the fun of that seeing the seeing the the audacious swings and misses um I love that. I love that uh, that um, Cohen McBee that came out last year. Oh man, might be my favorite. I Shakespeare adaptation. It is def yes, a hundred percent. I that that the aesthetic of that I is mean, kind of blades in the darky with the, all the all the angular um, uh, um, expressionist cinema of it. Um, it's funny you say that because I I mean that I love Cohen Brothers. I love Denzel. I love everybody in it. Um, I was ready, like primed. I am the perfect person to receive that work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's everything that I want. And I still couldn't get over how much I loved it. Like oh. it just really blew me away. The rules. And I spent the next couple days or actually a week or so, um, casting all of my projects aside and just vomiting out this game project that had been dormant in me that 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 movie was just like no you have to make this whoa <laughs> uh, and awesome. it's all just lying in parts you know and and images um right now but well i know what it is and it it just it was like a, a fishing line you know dropped <laughs> into my psyche and it just <laughs> dragged it out i it love was, it color oh, color man, me that. intrigued about whatever this project is i can't wait to see <laughs> well it. i've i've teased it on twitter a little bit so i'll say something about it um it's called the crossroads and it's um the the aesthetic and the uh, the way that they interpreted the play um really hit me the language of it the the freedom they had in places to kind of change yeah yeah even change the language um um some of my because there, there were a couple uh lines that I, I was just furiously writing in my notebook um the second time i watched it and uh as i was putting this this work together i was like oh i'll have a little epigraph or something at the beginning um i'll include this line and i'm searching for this line in the play and that that's not in there 
Uh, and <laughs> it's like, oh, shit. Mm. They're like, they're really taking some liberties and just a little bit. Like, it's not hugely different. But, no, no. Um, but uh, yeah, the Crossroads, it's, um, it is very much in that aesthetic that the that expressionist style um and very arch and very uh uh cold um a combination of that uh what feels like this sort of empty fallen domain where there's almost nothing um the landscape is barren and there's this, this strange angular castle and everything um that connected deep into my brain with one of the things other things i love the most which is dark souls and oh, yeah. the the from soft uh this is like a totally uh, undiscovered kind of country for me like i'm not a video game person like at all like okay I, yeah i know i i see i see the images and i'm really intrigued but i'm like i've never i just haven't broken the seal i haven't played like a video game since like chrono trigger <laughs> <laughs> oh cool that's a good one yeah um yeah it's i i'm, I'm a huge video game person but Dark Souls especially is, um, it has these qualities. It's very spare and um, the 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 lore such as it is, is often just in the description of an item mm. that's one sentence or, or 10 words long. Um, and it's this, it's also this kind of decayed place or em- a lot of empty rooms and spaces. And, um, and, and it's also often written in this mm. sort of archaic, uh, language, the thou kind of stuff. Um, and that particular mode of speech like lives in my brain like all the time. And um, I, 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 str- I, no, I try not to uh, because it's not like a huge area of expertise. But when I play demons in Blades in the Dark, I try to have them always speak in that archaic form. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> just to like give them that little twist. Um, but yeah, it just reached down into that place. My, my love of Dark Souls. Uh, and I could see this bright connecting line between those two points to to uh, the Coen Brothers movie and awesome its whole vibe the 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 witches um, yeah man especially man. like holy what shit what a banger um, and it just it like that that the connection between those spaces just like the game just went whoop <clears> and like came came out formed and I started writing I I never do like introductory fiction or anything I don't really like that in games usually. Um, but that's the first thing I did. I wrote a page, Ooh. like a scene, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> characters talking. I just couldn't, I was, I was like, this has to be, uh, like a play. It has to be like two, two characters in dialogue. That's how this, ha- this has to start. Awesome. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm so uh, stoked to see yeah. whatever this, whatever shape that takes. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I, yeah, it's, yeah, I oh, loved boy. that so much. And I, and, and another kind of like, like a Shakespeare in cinema revelation to me and kind of why you were talking and like, like really precisely describing that aesthetic, like the coldness, the the darkness, the spareness. Like I, uh, I watched, I, I, I had never seen it. I watched for the first time a few months ago, the Lawrence Olivier Henry V, mm-hmm. which is almost like it has the same level of artifice as that Cohen, yep. um, uh, Macbeth, but it, um, it, it, it's, it's candy colored, bright, it's it's storybook it's bayou tapestry it's like yes um it's it it was so beautiful like i the the opening shot of it is if you haven't seen it starts with this like amazingly beautiful and detailed um miniature of 16th century london that the camera just pans over like like it's mr rogers neighborhood before coming to rest (laughs) at the globe and and like it's so beautifully theatrical and artificial and it and it looks like a storybook illustration from like the 19th century come to life. Um, mm-hmm. You could you could like uh, yeah th- that that's a good Shakespeare double feature if you want some highly arch um, uh, aesthetized takes on it. Very much so. Yeah, complete diff- opposite from Branagh's like muddy yeah action movie uh, like, like very like out in the woods kind yeah. of version which i also love but that one rules also um, yeah like i yeah i haven't seen that have you seen the that fassbender marie cotillard Macbeth that also came out like 
maybe a oh or, i haven't seen that yet that's that's next I on my list completely forgot about it it's i i like them as actors but um i for some reason never saw it yeah i gotta check it out i is i forget who made it maybe the director didn't grab me i can't remember yeah. but the the storybook thing reminded me have you seen um uh the technicolor thai western uh tears of the black tiger no <laughs> that that sounds dope as hell yeah may <laughs> Make a note, everyone out there listening, highly recommended. All, all of all um, of the hot wrecks I get from you are uh, blank of the blank uh, animal because <laughs> you were you were the one whose uh, Twitter recommendation spurred me to see Son of the White Mare. Oh, good lord! Which um, if you let's just talk about that. Run, first. Uh, run, don't walk. <laughs> uh, punch your the computer you're watching this on across the room and go to your go to um fucking canopy or whatever and watch this movie. It is, it's it's just an impossibly beautiful um, uh, Hungarian, right? Yeah, Hungarian, Hungarian, like kind of mm-hmm. folk tale, animated, um, just in the most gorgeous, unique uh color just drenched in color psychedelic um style i watched his other movie johnny corncob which um yeah which is mm-hmm. which is way like the um like son of the white mirror looks a lot has a has some similar vibes to like yellow submarine and that kind of like uh and that animation and johnny corncob is yep. very yellow submarine it's also beautiful very and much. great but man son of the white mirror is a banger when like it's incredible uh, I mean, the fact too that it's not like cell animation; every frame is a painting. Yeah. Um, that undertaking a- alone is is wild. Oddles it's not the only one, but it's it's incredible what they did, and the aesthetic uh, is so bold. Um, it's it's. I, I'm guessing that it's riffing on um, some Hungarian folk art that I'm not right. as familiar with. I assume. Um, because it it feels like it's just come fully formed, like all its iconography and shape language and colors and everything is just like fully realized. Uh, yeah. If it's a if it's a unique work that's disconnected from folklore, I would be stunned. But um, man, the I, I I don't it, it, I don't even know what to say. That I always have a trouble pitching this movie. I just want to say like, here's a screenshot and that's enough you'll you'll go watch truly, it basically truly like it's just it, it, but, but so that's mm. our that's our plug for that but to get back to the thai western yeah. you recommended which is oh yeah but that, oh yeah that's just a, a similar <laughs> sounding similarly constructed name right right tears of the black tiger um amazing thai wet i mean i call it a western because it has the tropes of a western um it's set in thailand uh technicolor uh style um very much hearkening back to like gary cooper and um everyone wears like a neckerchief um and pink pastel you know western cowboy shirts and and cowboy hats but it's it's set in thailand and in a kind of realistic world except where people randomly dress like 50s and 60s cowboys um and (laughs) It has three different filmmaking styles that it jumps around in. One one being that Technicolor Western, one being somewhat uh, Ong Bak or like modern tire or Hong Kong action-ish space um, with like real practical stunts and shootouts and things. And then all the flashbacks are filmed like Harold Lloyd uh, kind of um, silent movie style. Wild. Um, and it's all layered. Uh, but... Um, the uh, Olivier thing reminded me um, for some of the gunfights uh, and and uh, showdowns. Rather than filming um, on location, they have sets uh, where the characters are on moving platforms that are that roll on, into frame to create the parallax as if the camera is moving, and the 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 background Whoa. is a painted painted wood boards with sunsets and clouds oh. that that move past like they're on stage. I love it. I love. I'm. I love. It is I love incredible. that stuff so much. Like, um, what? When was it made? What? What era are we talking? About? Uh God. I I was working at the Saddle Film Festival. Got it first. I think that was like two thousand two or something. Maybe. Um, maybe I can't remember the exact year, but 
it used to be impossible to find, but now it's always kind of like drifting through the various streaming services. Oh, so you'll you'll be able to find it for rent somewhere. Cool. Um, like, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, Do you know when it was made? I can't think of it. I, I can look it up right now. Oh, yeah. Um, no worries. But yeah, like I like yeah, like Technicolor hyper theatrical artifice is like I'm I just love that stuff. So amazing. It was made in 2000. OK, OK. Um, so relatively. Recently. Yeah. Man, yeah, it's another one of those that just jewels where you're like this. There's nothing like this. Yeah, it's yeah. So, so magical. I'm just like, yeah, like the there's there's something in that like expressionistic uh, uh, Joel Cohen Macbeth that it has that kind of like diorama <laughs> quality to mm -hmm. like, um, and and the and the Henry the Fifth is like the candy colored version of it it's the ensanguinated um uh, <laughs> yes um i don't know like but you can almost feel that like like you said german expressionism or like lady from shanghai or you know like there's like i don't know what they if they did this but i i'm feeling that forced perspective set building where you know it looks less like this huge staircase but it's like really like eight feet deep right and right all you're i don't i don't know if they did that but it it conjures up those ideas um yeah where it's it's taking that it's like bringing it full circle um this is would be a stage production that we would have to stage with suggestions of castles and and ramparts and stuff um <sighs> but now we're going to take that and film it in a more realized way but also like bring it back around so it seems like it's on stage in, in a sense yeah um, yeah um uh, mm. no. yeah there's gotta be um well yeah so set, set your next uh, freaking fantasy campaign in one of those worlds. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait wait for four or five years and you can play this game that I'm talking about. Gauntlet. Because it probably won't be done before then. <laughs> yeah. I, you j Just like you must have seen like I uh, when I when all the streaming services hit like I I and there was there was this um, novel coronavirus pandemic also. I don't know if you've heard which mm. kept, kept me inside quite a bit. I've heard so I watched a lot of movies. Yeah. But like the Japanese movie, I think it was Quaidan, Quaidan, mm -hmm. like another one that's like hyper Good hyper Lord. artifice, but it was just like jaw dropping. The the segment in there where there's there's a bunch of like um samur like set warring states era sea battles staged in yes. an, in, in an interior set with like these elaborate, wildly decorated boats with like a rear projected like sunset painted backdrop. It is insane yeah it's so beautiful so good it, that that for people who haven't seen it it's like a an anthology of japanese ghost stories so, sort of um each a little vignettes yeah uh and beautifully photographed right uh like these really stark moments um singular i think the the cover is the is the tattooing yes uh, or, or the face painting the tattoo um, or, yeah or painting prayers all over uh, a mm -hmm. monk he has to be protected like i mean it's uh, conan right they do mm -hmm. that in conan um but yeah quite on and have you seen kuro neko in the in that same vein Shoot, no no i think it's from the 50s black and white japanese ghost story um beautiful it's it definitely was an influence on quite on um gotta see it and has some really cool ways of solving the problem of portraying a ghost uh when you know your film technology and special effects are kind of non-existent uh they do amazing things to make to make that work awesome uh, really cool yeah but i have a lot of wreck, hot wrecks here but like quinon is like if you if you wanted a series of ghost stories told with the filmic language of like uh like gene kelly dance ballet in like the middle of <laughs> singing in the rain that's 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 your that's quite it. Um, That's what it feels like. Yeah. It feels like they're just on, you know, st soundstage seven at at, at uh, Paramount or whatever. Yeah. And, um, um, I'll, yeah, it, we're great. Mm -hmm. Tears of the Black Tiger and Kuroneko. Now I've got my 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 Rex <laughs> for the yep. week. You got homework. Yeah, homework. Play Dark Souls. You know. Oh, jeez. Uh, I, I I'm scared <laughs> of getting of getting a game system because I'm I feel like I'll get I'll like it too much. It's the same reason I don't have TikTok. <laughs> yeah oh geez yeah i i tried that too i and i still dip back in because there's some really good rpg tiktokers sure. but um i when i realized i had been flipping or watching it for like an hour straight i was like oh no this is bad yeah uh, but with games at least i can it's my job right so right. i can um 
it's research. Justify it's research. Yeah. playing uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey for a hundred hours. You know, I'm, I'm doing research. Yeah. 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 Oh boy. I know. I'm. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. But I think um, on to this point of media recs and media literacy and and riffing like this with like oh it's it's Busby Berkeley it's uh, Buster Keaton it's uh, Lawrence Olivier um, it's something I recommend uh, to game designers and and players like because the medium of role play is this, you know, folk thing where we're kind of like sitting and t- talking and conjuring images in our mind, like media literacy is a huge power in tabletop where if I, if I'm able to say German expressionist Macbeth yeah, and everyone goes, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's so economical. And, and it, it, it is a functional, uh, like, tool that you can use at the table if everybody has those touchstones um yeah and it's something that i list in my books now like here are the touchstones like oh cool go, go listen to this song read read this book look watch this movie or read the summary or something um and there's usually you know 20 and if you have three of them then we we're off and running now now i can just say like city of lost children and you go okay yeah 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 city of lost children it's like that yeah, it's it's you know that Dus- dusk fall city of lost children that there you go mm-hmm. that's if you know that you know it and that's, you're good God, yeah i i i knew that before you even said it i was like like i was like <laughs> what's the main what's what's the world like um it's like uh, it's kind of a victorian gothic like, like a lot of people say peaky blinders but it's like it's city of lost children <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's just like yeah mm-hmm. like the plumes of steam odd uh everything everything's everything's dark and moist sun never rises uh uh eerily colored waters um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah yeah car car uh, haunted carnival vibes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I was in a game group for a little while that we we always did the like casting the show kind of thing you know who which actors playing your character and, oh, that's fun <laughs> um and then we developed that to the genre ma- movie mashups or genre mashups where when someone was going to pitch the next game series or whatever, they would say like, oh, it's it's uh, uh, Battlestar Galactica, but Throne of Blood or, you know, whatever. And you'd be like, OK, uh, yes, sick. <laughs> I, get, <laughs> I get where you're coming from. It's uh, uh, ancient Rome, but it's the wire. Uh, and our one anachronism is that people have cigarettes. Uh, cool. All right. Perfect. Great. Yeah. They they found a way to cu- cultivate a smokable weed in uh in the yeah. in in the in the Syrian colony, and uh, but that's but that's why I, I I you know I playing games and also absorbing all this media I feel like is part of the job uh, at, as the designer and then at the table. Um, leveraging all that stuff oh yeah i I feel that another another way in which this kind of stuff rhymes with improvisation is that like i think you're it's it's building a frame of reference and like just like you say like like we were talking about where you read a book and you're and you can kind of like start to try on the the vernacular of a of a of a hyper specific time period or region or author's voice genre voice and then and and put it up on its feet in a in a show is so is so fun yeah oh that reminds me i wanted to ask you about von villiers oh, yeah. um, <laughs> uh time for chaos uh we've been talking about blades a lot but uh time for chaos uh folks is glass cannons um call of cthulhu series um set in the um 20s and um Vaughn is Ross's character, a soldier of the Great War, uh, who who uh, has um, survived that war mm-hmm. somewhat. Um, and the, that character is one of my favorites of yours. And uh, I think the the process of that character being expressed through that series, all the characters on that show, this is true of, but. Um, I felt like you really found that character through, through the process of play. That's what it looked yeah, like. Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. Um, like, yeah, I was wondering because Cthulhu can let you kind of like preload a lot of stuff sometimes for characters. I was wondering like for, for your process with Vaughn and also the language, your, your uh, facility with the period um, vernacular is 
really strong um and including like reciting uh period poetry and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that I, was, um, I get into it I, I like to start to read it read it when I'm doing it yeah that was my question like for me I often do that when I'm playing something I'll get be attracted to the source material and get into it mm -hmm. I was wondering if that was true here or if that was something that you already had kind of in your bones from other work I, ha I, I had it like I went through a, a I read um I talked a little bit about this with Joe I think but I I uh I'm a big fan of that Pat Barker regeneration series, which I don't know if mm. you read regeneration is the first book I in the door. I haven't read them, but really good. Yeah. Um, but there, it's about like the war poets and, um, just the, just sort of the cultural milieu of, of, um, home front post mid war and post war, um, England. And it presents a vision of that, which is like really, uh, scary <laughs> and like, uh, um, and so that was in my, uh, that it's a character where the preloading such as it was, was all the cultural reference touchstones that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So it was mm -hmm. Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen and the, the war poets. And it, and I, I'd, I'd read, uh, Brideshead Revisited, um, pretty uh, recently. Nice. And so Evelyn Waugh was uh -huh. deep in there and I, I read, uh, uh, Vile Bodies, um, and I, I just like vile bodies in particular is like really big into all the, the, the that crackling um, uh, 20s. Yes, yes. Tw it's, it's just like dripping with all that uh, 20s slang. And um, and then uh, Brideshead is a little bit more austere as far as that goes, but is a, is a more like maybe emotionally dense and gets into all the weird class, uh, weird from an American perspective, class stuff. Yeah. And um and also, like I was, um, I noticed that there was a lot of these, like um, these fellows of that era, who writers of that era, who were really drawn to Catholicism, <laughs> um, like <laughs> to to this this like ornament, who seemed to be almost drawn to it more for like its aesthetic aesthetics first, yeah, um, yeah, and and so that was kind of, that was really it, and uh, and so finding. Yeah, so it's like, I feel like that's kind of that's almost a stock character in in Call of Cthulhu is the sort of traumatized World War One veteran, but like I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to play this or find finding finding a guy who was like a oh and a, another I'm I'm kind of rambling on all over the place, but another friend of mine no no go 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 another friend of mine had I hadn't read this book, but he was telling me about this book that he was reading about some of the first people to climb for first um um English people to climb Everest. And a lot of these guys were World War One veterans who like got out of, who got out of the service and were just like, um, well, wonderful, uh, amazing experience. Uh, I'll never talk about that again. And for <laughs> no uh, readily apparent reason, I'm going to climb the tallest mountain in the world and uh, live in Nepal. Um, like, uh, it's, it's like just the have have my men send my bags at their earliest convenience. But, exactly. Uh, I, I, I will. I shan't be needing them. Right. So yeah. like these these guys who like if they'd stayed home. Um, are like gonna go around the club and be and have my friends in parliament, but like they've just had this like such a deep shock to their system. They're just like off to the remotest portion of the colony to deal with my repression of this insane yeah. trauma by by um mm -hmm. by like uh living um at, at the bleeding edge of life. Um, yeah, let's get right back into that. Uh, I might die this today. Right. Uh, feeling. In the, um, yeah. In the way that wow. you read some veterans' memoirs, like, like, I, I'm really interested in veterans' memoirs, and and like I, I read that uh, another another the uh, um, Robert Graves one, "Goodbye to All That," which is really good, um, where he talks about. His oh time yeah, that's on my list. Yeah, it's terrific. And but but or, or like for example. Um, Remark, who wrote a, um, All Quiet on the Western Front, clearly is like, oh my God, this was debasing like uh, to the human soul. This was a charnel house. Um, and then Ernst Junger, same side, writes Storm of Steel. And he's like, yeah, it was hell. And in a way, I loved it. <laughs> like, um, and, and so people come out of these wars like the, that, that, that experience is like, the, that trauma, it, like part of it is carrying the guilt of like, it was fun in a way like it was it yeah. was it's horrible <laughs> that, that it was that the, that i was like really excited and going back to the drudgery of like 1920s like 
social, like I go from like, I'm going to die at any moment to like, go around the club for a brandy, <laughs> like another day of this, like it's I mean, if it here never we are happened. 20, 20, and that's, that's the story 20, of, of my generation and the generation of below yeah. who's like, like everyone of, of my generation, like went and fought, went like a, a sizable portion, proportion of them, not me, went and fought in, in, the, in, these, in these conflicts in the war on terror, came back. And the story of our, one of the story of our time is like my generation in the three or four beneath, like processing this, this war trauma that our, that our culture is completely inadequate at resolving. And, and we, thus we have this, these like, like a, a, a opioid crisis and, and crying uh, like so much of so much of the the raving and um, hyperbolic populist politics of our moment is can can get back to like the just all the all these weird forces libidinal forces that were unleashed and repressed by this by this conflict and and the twenty yeah. and the twenties is like. It's all that same stuff. Also, economic crisis. It's like we're all, all the same. We're, sw yeah. we're swimming in the same soup. So it's it's truly shameful that hundreds and hundreds of years uh, ha we have still fail in the same ways. And um, I, I don't know if you've seen the unit, David Mamet's uh, and, and Sean and Ryan's um, television show no. about about soldiers. Uh, it it is very much about the home front and the ways that the system fails people. And that's what one aspect of it, of course, is reintegration and caring about soldiers when they're no longer fighting. And, um, it has a lot of to say about that. It's really great. Um, but I, I appreciated that with Vaughn, um, uh, having that character, uh, not like I felt that th there was a process of discovery for you and also, um, for the audience to kind of like get those layers, you know, starting out from a place of, well, I'm, I'm just having, I'm meeting my friends for drinks and it's all going to be very surface and mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm putting on a brave front or whatever it is and having that space to kind of reveal and pull back. Cause you know, like again, the, the fit characters, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you play Call of Cthulhu that your character's psyche is going to be peeled away. Yeah. Uh, so why not make a character that, has a facade right right uh, um that so you know because you know it's coming off uh -huh, exactly <laughs> um, and, and that i yeah. think you 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 kind of described in two senses what i was like groping at in all directions a second ago which is that yeah part of what the thing that fascinates me maybe the most about all that is like i'm so fascinated by these overeducated genteel colonial um uh english men of letters who can like um quote virgil in latin at you <laughs> <laughs> but who also had been like knee deep in rats, like for two years watching everyone they know blown to pieces and sucking mm -hmm. down poison gas and then come back and have to like <laughs> square that. Um, yeah. And, and then yeah, and they gotta go to the club. And they're and, just expected uh, yeah. to like slip that, slip that Oxfordian mask back on <laughs> and like pretend it never mm -hmm. happened. Um, and there was, and there was also, I, I just like so much of the story of those, like, just there's there and the added layer of like, so many of those writers seem to be dealing with a lot of repressed sexuality as well. Um, that that was my next point. Yes, and that uh, and that comes from E. M. Forster, <laughs> um, of course. Where, yes, I, that I, I assumed. Um, so, and and again, it, it, another place given the time setting of the game, and the politics of its age. Um, that's another layer of that psyche that I, and in a sense, in a way, and I think this is interesting the way you played it, uh, a, a more repressed, um, component than the war. Oh yeah. Uh, psychological damage. Like, <laughs> because it's, it's like pre existent. It's, it's, it's repressed from, from, from existence and, and then new traumas were piled on top of it. Uh, yeah. It... The, yeah, the, the the scene. Well, I, I actually, you know what? I'm not going to give spoilers for Time for Chaos. <laughs> Blades, Blade Show. I, 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 Blades is my thing. I'm not going to give spoilers. There's some beautiful, beautiful scenes around this uh, point with with Vaughn, um, and and the nature of what Call of Cthulhu is really about. Uh, that I think. It, go watch it. Go watch Time for Chaos. It's wonderful. Um, 
and it's yep. it's instructive uh for for people who want to play the game uh in a very dramatic way um i think it's really nice it, it, it's a nice um primer on again like creating fit characters that 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 then fit the gears together and as you play like it, it, it's it, you bring so much to it as a performer because this is your wheelhouse and you have these skills as a as a performer and a writer but at the same time people who d maybe don't have all, all those skills just by priming their character that the game system is going to turn some of those gears yeah you're gonna start to fail those sandy checks you're gonna start to have to think about what that breakdown looks like and where it's coming from mm -hmm. and even if you just sort of summarize it and say well they act like this now um yeah yeah you're playing the game absolutely <laughs> you're absolutely. playing you're like you're you're in it um like yeah i really hope that that yeah please do listen and i feel it's a podcast as well if that's your preferred medium um time for chaos and 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 uh in in haunted city but i feel like yeah both of these both of these shows and it's a testament to um troy and jared too are they're they're very instructional without being instructional videos like they're like it'll <laughs> if you're if you haven't played yeah. these games before i think it'll really it'll make you it'll demystify them if you've um i i don't know if this is the case it seems to be just in my limited exposure to rpg social media like so much is like i can't convince my players to try anything other than D D, or like i'm kind of burned out on D. &D. Yeah. like um yeah like i love D, D, but like yeah if you want to stretch out like call of cthulhu is the one that Call of Cthulhu is the game that made me kind of fall in love with RPGs because it's so because it it lends itself much like Blades to being to playing in this kind of like dramatic um, audio drama kind of gear. Yeah, it definitely does, and I mean, it almost lines up really well with like radio drama in a way, like the voices of the characters, the setting. Um, it has that vibe completely. Uh, but before we wrap up, I, I I did want to talk a little bit about. Um, your sort of entree into this uh i know you've covered it a little bit in some other interviews but um i was shocked to find out that you've been playing role-playing games for what like five ish years or something yeah it may, it's maybe more than that now like but yeah it's not long like six yeah -ish. yeah um and, and and running games as well did, did you start running early on in the process or is that a new that's pretty new i just game. for just for uh friends uh, um mary lou and uh zach reno and clint uh and uh and um megan uh i i'm i'm lucky to run a D, &D campaign with them we've been on a in one of those extended breaks where i'm like <laughs> are, we, oh, yeah. are we coming back <laughs> but um yeah but, that'll that'll happen but uh it's um yeah i had a, a a moment i was running a game for mary lou actually and uh amazing person and awesome role player yes um and just off cut off the cuff was like do you do you play do you have home games or whatever and she's like oh i'm in ross's D, D game and i was like excuse me oh, <laughs> oh it's so fun uh, do, do and then she listed all those amazing people that are in that group and i was yeah. like jesus okay well that's that's cool <laughs> they make nice group they make it really easy on a first time dm um i could uh, yeah i can imagine uh, because they're all so down to clown and to run with whatever you throw out and our in our friend sarah uh, Kaplan is also in that group. Um, yeah, yeah, Sarah's great. Great, yeah, and um, Sarah. so, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's that's only like maybe a year and a half ago. Um, basically, okay. it was like I think like Jared and Clint's GURPS game was down a player, and they asked someone in the group who who could join. And our buddy Thomas was like, uh, "Ross would do this," and um, and so that and so I played GURPS with them for one session. And then that just happened to be at a time when they were about to start a, a Cthulhu game. And, and then we just let it rip. And honestly, the third game we played, I think even ever before we played Dungeons and Dragons was Clint got the Blades in the Dark book. And we, we played one session of Blades in the Dark, like years ago. I still remember, mm -hmm. like, I still remember the cutter Goldie that I played. <laughs> it's like nice. It very, very Ron Perlman from from uh, from uh, City of Lost Children. City vibes. of Lost Children. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Um, so, you, so you played GURPS, uh, Call of Cthulhu, Blades, D and D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a very similar thing. I, I played Gamma World, uh, and um, Tunnels and Trolls, and um, Call of Cthulhu. 
Star Wars, D6, uh, various games before I played D&D. D&D was like further along in my gaming uh, life. It wasn't my starting point. Um, I'm always curious, like, I, I don't know if that changes people's trajectories or not, because I, st I feel like I hear more stories of people starting with D&D and staying there. Yeah. Um, but people that start other places, I feel like tend to wander more, I think. I don't know. Maybe that's just anecdotal. But. Maybe, yeah. I think it, I'm, I was totally at the beholden to the the tastes and, and, and uh, interests of uh, Jared and Clint, who are kind of the, the beating heart of that little crew. And yeah, and they're such like heads and and down to try so many different things um, that I was just kind of like yeah. along for the ride, luckily. And yeah, yeah, and and, and the, but then we kind of we we played a good long Call of Cthulhu session, session, and then uh, our campaign, and then we started a D and D one, and that was and we went we did that for like three years and brought it to a full oh, wow. brought it to a full conclusion. Was that the was that the campaign that was broadcast with the huge finale and the big showdown fight and everything, or was that? Oh, that not the streamed one. No, um, that that was that was uh, maybe, um, the the big long one for stream of blood was all vampire. Um, oh, oh, I thought you were you not in the D? No, I guess you weren't in the D and D one that they they wrapped up. Yeah, with, no, the, with the big finale fight. No, no. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of a different one. But um. Yeah, that was all. That was all at home, um, and a cool. lot of it was over Zoom during during pan COVID peak times. Yeah, yeah. I it's it. I have to ask because it has a reputation. It, I I love GURPS, but um, it's it is the type of game that could certainly turn someone off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, given its uh uh complexity and everything. Um, I, Did, were you like, oh, this is awesome. I want to play more GURPS. Or were you more like, um, what else you got? <laughs> I was, I was, my takeaway from that experience, it was just one session. My takeaway from that was not like, got to play more GURPS. It was like, I just want to play with these people. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll see. It's just because like, I mean, Clint was so accommodating and like knew I had made a character. I was coming into a game in progress. So he basically had a couple mm -hmm. for me to choose from and that he that he'd made and oh nice and, uh, nice and so i was off to the races right away and then i kind of but and i and i listened to some like i listened to like a, a couple one like an actual play podcast that kind of mm. like got me used to like the rhythms of it and stuff so i'm one of those yeah people, what a godsend yeah being yeah. able to learn from people i mean if if my friend Nadja famously is the antidote it's been told a million times but she she had never done any role playing she watched I think it was Critical Role. It was some prominent AP show, um, one episode, and then ran D and D like the next day for her friends. Yeah, <laughs> um, and was just like, "Yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I saw what they did. I, I mean, that makes sense." <laughs> okay. Um, I, I wish I, if we had had that back in the day. I mean, it's it's, a, it's such a great yeah. tool. Um, I, uh... I I wanted to say real quick. The I, first time I played GURPS, I was invited to someone's ongoing game as well, uh, and the premise was they were like fiction it was like a sliders or, or stargate atlantis or something where they're going through these portals to different places but it's all like different genres of fiction and um <laughs> it's all you know you like portal into uh, tom sawyer or something um huckberry finn um and uh so they're all playing fictional characters so the gm says make a fictional character in curbs there's no point limits or anything just make any fictional fictional character you want um and come to the session and you know you'll jump in and mess around so we show up and they're playing like i don't know someone was playing like uh the mad hatter from alice in wonderland and um various characters and uh he says okay and i hadn't talked to my buddy uh he's like what who did you bring and my buddy's like macgyver, I'm MacGyver. <laughs> uh, i put all my points into one skill it's called macgyver <laughs> 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 and the gm's like oh, cool fair play all right yeah i'll allow it let's go um john who did you bring i'm like i'm darth vader <laughs> <laughs> and so we just had this insane session of the mad hatter and darth vader and macgyver and, oh man it was it was incredible uh, i i have always wanted to go back there uh maybe with curves even um yeah. and uh play that again too you know, they're a messed up team, but damn it, they get results. <laughs> <laughs> they're just too damn good. Yeah. 
Oh my lord! Yeah, this one was like a uh, slightly less freewheeling. It was like, but but <laughs> you're describing sort of a cracked version of Alan Moore, who's like, yes, let me throw yeah, a bunch of references yeah. in a cocktail shaker. And this was this was the one we played with uh, Clint was like, uh, it was basically like Watchmen, like '70s mm-hmm. era um, um, superhero team. Um, and I, I forget what the character cool. was, but it was like a he was a guy who was like a roller disco themed superhero <laughs> who had like rocket skates. <laughs> nice. <Yeah>. Nice. <laughs> I, I do like the Watchmen conceit that like basically everyone is just a dude in a funny suit except for one guy who's God. Right. Like, there's yeah. no there's kind of no nothing in between. Yeah. The, it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, God. Yeah. I, I think I interrupted you. You were shifting gears away from groups, but um, I I don't even remember. Um, yeah, yeah that, but that's that's my that's my that's my that's my 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 past. Well, that's cool. I wanted yeah, to play I, as a I, kid. I, I would have played if it had been available. Like I feel like I grew up so kind of relatively move, like moving around and kind of and like in high school mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody who played or they were maybe like too embarrassed to tell anybody. <laughs> like. It was only in college, like I knew a guy who played Warhammer and he had the Vampire Masquerade book. And I read that mm. like, th- or at least like thumbed through it enough to be like, hmm, so that's what a Malkavian is. Like, like <laughs> this looks interesting and also kind of funny. <laughs> like, that was definitely a game that tried to, uh, I don't know if Mark Rain Hagen and those guys were like theater kids, but it kind of seemed like they were. Uh, you know, they, they wanted to have the, your chronicle and your, you choose your theme up front and mm. then, you know, you want, it's dramatic yeah, uh, yeah. storytelling and everything the, the GM's called the storyteller. And, um, it definitely, when it first came out, uh, it was a big splash in, in the gaming scene and where I grew up and the people I played with, it was, it was very cross, uh, clicks. Mm-hmm. So like the people in the, my game groups were like the football players and the theater kids and everybody the stoners like everybody played rpgs together that's which is strange great. um yeah. it was really good but it, unusual um but when vampire came out outside of our circle of like cl- cross click kids definitely the goth kids and the theater kids like <laughs> all just like showed up for that um, yeah yeah it's in the middle of that and, goth theater kid venn diagram <laughs> oh yeah and uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It, we're launched a lot of role players i think black um, black mesh tank top uh, energy yeah um i have what my final thought final question if we, if we we should probably wrap this up yeah. um i was thinking about um being a player versus being a gm or being a performer versus a writer um all these things that kind of like your your venn diagrams of all the things that that you do um and the for me, I I kind of have this these modes in my in mind of yeah. effortful skill versus effortless skill. Um, doing something kind of like at my peak, like pushing and like driving, like I'm I'm doing something that's difficult and I enjoy it, and I'm like sh- striving to do really well. Versus like this is casual, bre- easy breezy. I might be performing at a high high level, but it's like. I'm just, I got this. I'm very comfortable. Yeah. It's not, doesn't drain me. Um, doesn't drain my energy. I, I, I feel, feel fine. Um, and looking at my like areas of activity and the things I like to do effortful versus effortless is to me, like there's certain kind of things that track there. Um, running a game is to me, like feels very effortless. Like I can show up with no prep. I feel fine. I'm not worried about it yada yada yada. i've done this a million times um something that i've done almost as much like i don't know something physical like jujitsu or something like i I should i'm i I feel fine i'm relaxed i'm not like stressed about it but i'm trying as hard as i can Mm -hmm. you know i'm Mm -hmm. like right there and so thinking about role play and like and then watching you like improv shakespeare improv musicals stuff to me that feels like I would be just like on the razor's edge of effort <laughs> doing those things. Um, I was wondering like if 
if that if that analogy or that dichotomy makes sense like yes i was wondering how you think about those things in your in your wheelhouse of of stuff yeah i mean all that really i mean that resonates with me I, although i haven't thought of it that way i think it's um yeah uh <sighs> improv for the most part feels at this point just because of pure reps it feels a little bit more effortless where like you can just show mm. up and, and go. Um, mm -hmm. uh, with certain shows though, like um, one of the reasons I like the Improvised Shakespeare Company show, like is that like it pushes you to use like, I, I feel like when that, when I, when I feel the most satisfied by that show, I feel like I'm, I am like, like kind of like you say, like at the bleeding edge of whatever your like mental capability is to like really, really try to have a lot of balls in the air and, 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 and have a lot of pick, pick your circus skill analogy. Plates are spinning <laughs> and balls are in the air and the motorcycles mm -hmm. on fire. And, but you, but you somehow <laughs> get it all, um, stick the landing. Um, so it's kind of both like it's show dependent. Um, but, but, but like, I, yeah. it, but I have done it enough to where like, it's, it feels, it does feel fun and doesn't feel like, and feels really rewarding. Kind of your standard improv show. You're not like, okay, I got to really focus up here no. and give it my all. You're like, I got this. It is, yeah. Yeah. Not, and it's, yeah. and it's weird because it's not like you're, it's not like you're checked out. You, it only works if you're kind of sure. focused up, but it's, it's not like, yeah, I do. I do not feel that like level of like pressure. And in a way, I feel like mm. imposing that pressure uh, is is too is only to your detriment. <laughs> like yeah. so much, sure. so much of of doing well as an improviser is getting out of your own way, um, mm. thinking and trying less, um, and and just totally. being a being receptive, being like listen, react, attend to patterns. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the thing that feels more like effortful to me is is something like writing, where like it's it's way more like um it, it feels way more like uh, work and and so much of like yeah from right You're lifting writing, the boulder yeah, yeah totally totally and like yeah. okay that didn't work how do we how do we fix that um yeah yeah it's way more way more uh yeah way more effortful yeah, yeah. i feel that with writing for two for sure uh um, not not to the point where it's a chore no no although that, that does happen sometimes but for sure um there is that sense of like and not even lifting the boulder but the sisyphean boulder sometimes like i just gotta i, I spent all that time pushing it up here and i know it turns out i gotta start over and i gotta do it again and that 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 process yeah i guess maybe partially because writing is so much editing that you you get the act of writing feels to me like just um the first part of a long process that i know i'm gonna have to right right you turn. you know so much um, <laughs> like like yeah you're like okay yeah. i'm just gonna write this bad script and then the real work <laughs> begins uh yeah, exactly yeah exactly um, yeah the like um interesting too like just a, a slightly different type of writing where it does feel like work but also really fun was like like writing I was fortunate enough to to write for like the show Mystery Science Theater, and like that is just like joke writing, like just you write, yeah. you just are writing in an evening, just like so many jokes, and like there are times where you're like, my tank is empty, <laughs> but and yeah. and then like uh, and and but you put you gotta fucking push through because there's two more minutes of bad movie where why isn't there any dialogue? We gotta fill all this with jokes, like um and. And, uh, and then, and some days it's like, man, the, the muse is really hitting. And then some days you're like, guys, this is what I got. <laughs> like, I can't, um, I can't, but I always think of the, like Dana Gould, Conan O'Brien era of the Simpsons, where, you know, someone came into the writer's room and was like, give us 200 funny names for a laundromat, you know, yeah, like, yeah, good God. like, okay, well that's, yeah, that, that's what we're doing. Uh -huh. uh, you got, you got to get it done. You got to crank it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, sometimes like the, like in the, in, in improv, you're often going for like first idea, best idea, especially at the beginning. 
as you can you yeah. can you can kind of like delve a little deeper as you get deeper into it but like it is fun like when it does happen where you're like banging your head against the wall like how do you write a joke for this moment and then you're <laughs> suddenly in your fourth or fifth idea is like hey all right it, it did okay and then like and then you see if it and then you see if it kills in the zoom call <laughs> like <laughs> yeah you know thinking about what you just said it I wonder if there's some correlation psychologically between effortful things and a sense of achievement. Um, whereas the effortless things you're like, well, yeah, I can do that. I see yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it was that we had a fun session. I liked it. And people like, that was so cool. Like you're such a good GM, whatever they say. And you're like, well, I just yeah, did. Fine. I mean, I did the thing. I, 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 but when you're doing the heart, the work, the effortful thing, um, again, I guess this goes back to the the painter with the gloss on the on the hand. Yeah, it's like, like what we we're describing, uh, like the shows that felt easy because, like, mm -hmm. it, it, I was just a vessel; it was speaking through me. Like the audience, I, I don't get the sense the audience doesn't like them. I think they really do enjoy. But I notice yeah. the audience is more like more responsive when we feel like, damn, we were like like banging that thing into shape <laughs> with, <laughs> with with crowbar and and sledgehammer and they're like yeah. and and that seems to be like they but there is there is something satisfying about the show like that when you when it like comes together like when you when that yeah when that rusty old hulk makes it makes it <laughs> crashes onto the runway and slides spewing sparks <laughs> to its <laughs> um, into into the gate um it's like oh we mm. did it guys uh yeah i think yeah I, yeah I, wow interesting um yeah yeah it's yeah getting yourself to fall in love with the the effort for it yeah yeah exactly it's the, the process enjoying or not enjoy is maybe the wrong word but being invested in the process yeah, yeah. uh is is key to all creative work i think or, or almost all work period but um when when you might not otherwise do it uh it is it's something that is being being created um not out of necessity uh but because of your drive or your vision or your or your uh, whatever it is um if the process of making the thing is is too onerous i think uh it's the it's you do it, burnout is the is the path there uh yeah yeah um, yeah it doesn't have to be pleasant uh it can be a slog it can be feeling like you're straining with all your might um but right if and i feel yeah. like i feel like maybe part of the 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 one way that the poison of effortlessness is like like when you're in those moments where it feels like a slog there's part of you that's like well, if this is good, it should be easy. It's like, it's not, <laughs> yeah, not yeah. time. My partner, Allison and I, she, we both did athletics in various ways. And um, we often talk about how that, if, if someone is like a pure, like arts kid, you know, um, sometimes you can tell the difference because the, that athletic thing, it does, it, you do have some you, like skill or uh, experience in that space of like, it's all this effortful thing. It's competitive. Like someone is trying to stop you, you know, it's like yeah. I, I'm trying to write my novel and someone is like trying to stop me. From, <laughs> that doesn't happen. Right. Um, and you, you get used to that like pressure or, mm -hmm. or this, that sense of, and it doesn't become effortless. It It's still like totally striving, but it's like the activity itself is, uh, ha has friction and, and pressure. Um, and so you kind of like do, part of you that's part of the fun of the of the thing right right is you know if there was no other team and you were just shooting baskets it's not as it's not interesting right um the, putting yourself in that space where you are at the edge where you're doing those shows where you're like ah, oh, we have to we have to solve a problem mm -hmm. things have turned sideways you know um yeah it it can be it's very rewarding uh yeah those are uh, like yeah so many of the moments that like so many like improv shows happen and they're flushed out of your memory. <laughs> like um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the few mm -hmm. things that you remember are like often those things that were like went wrong <laughs> that, that, um, right. That you right. can, that then you find a way of grappling with and beating into shape. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah, we're talking about drama it's in sports or in, in arts or whatever it is like it, the, the moment of tension, the moment of peril, 
Jeopardy cl climax crisis. Mm -hmm. Like that's you. Th that's what you remember. That's the you catch the big pass. You you do the thing. It's um, it could have gone otherwise. Mm -hmm. it, you, mm -hmm. it could have failed. It could have fallen apart. Um, you, so it's catharsis and yeah. it's um, all that. I wasn't I wasn't expecting like your real like pep talk out of this conversation, but I'm like <laughs> now I'm fired up. I'm gonna, <laughs> Well, good. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. Uh, you are you are uh, blowing up on the scene right now. <laughs> I'm seeing you in all this cool shit. Uh, Hopefully, uh, the very first time I saw you, by the way, uh, you played a, a character on a television show that I love so much, uh, The Good Place. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, small part there, yeah. Allison and I really loved that. Uh, character and were like had like commented on you oh, that's back great. then and we're like <laughs> we we're like oh that guy's so cool and it was this amazing moment uh, years later to when i showed the screenshot and she was like holy shit that's Ross Murray. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah but all that to say uh i'm uh, yes get fired up uh yeah I, i'm excited to see i i know you've got stuff in the works domination um, domination in 2023 <laughs> that's right that's right you're gonna slay tomorrow the uh, world <laughs> it, it, is there is there any do you want to promote anything or or, or, or do you got stuff uh, coming out you want to talk about or, or i feel like we kind of uh, we kind of talked but, through we talked through all the stuff that i would i would point people towards because i feel like so much of the stuff that i've loved working on most has been these have been these like small subscriber funded like uh bespoke internet things yes which um totally which is like something that didn't even exist when i was coming up and now is like something that's absorbing so much of my energy and like so yeah please if you're i mean if you're watching this then chances are you're a gaming person uh and i know if you, as if you needed us to say it one more time uh <laughs> check out haunted city on the glass cannon uh either on vod or in podcast form and also time for chaos on the glass cannon um they're they're i think they're i think they're good actual plays and if you're and especially if you're curious about blaze in the dark or call of cthulhu much like the adventure zone or whatever demystified uh dungeons and dragons um for me hopefully this might 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 uh evangelize to you as well um yes very much so yeah uh, and, and and get a dropout tv yeah, subscription dropout subscription there's, uh, there's good stuff there. it is shockingly cheap shockingly cheap yeah uh and it is one of the great uh entertainment platforms on tv or on the internet and You'll get to see all the cool shows Ross is in. It's painted, man. Yeah, yeah. There's tons of good stuff on there. And man, the, the team there is also just like, if this helps, the team there is like certified mensches, good people, and um, and like just I uh, coming from the improv community, like improv is always like trying to find a way of like, how do you put this on screen without making it lose by that, that makes it accessible. That doesn't like shave off all the edges. And like, I think like Sam Reich and the people over there have really found a way of like bottling improvisation in this kind of, uh, in this visual streaming format that like really does work. And that's hard. Yeah. And they, they, they it's very them. hard. It's, Im it's impressive. I th a very high compliment that I saw someone say the other day, because I'm a big fan of this type of television. Um, someone said that it is like the American version of the best British panel shows. It's yeah. Um, yeah. Like QI and, and that kind of thing. And, and I, I, I feel that very much with, with the dropout stuff. And after, after speaking to him, that's very much in, in their, on their mind, like that, those, that sort of, that energy is like what they're going for. So that's great to, great to hear. You so see, yeah, get a dropout subscription, check out Mr. Science Theater. It has a, it's, there's new episodes. Yes. Gizmoplex.com. Check it out. I'm so psyched. I, I didn't want to fanboy too hard, but MST is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, so yes, uh, love it. Love that you're doing that work. It's, it's so cool. So amazing. Thank you so much for doing this, Ross. This was a delight. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, we will we will hook up again in the future. Yeah, we'll talk about Haunted City season two once it's over, oh, presumably God. when that happens. Yeah, <laughs> when, when when all of us have like twenty characters when the rem yeah when the remnants like is half of army. them will be in prison. Yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah, sweet <laughs> the whole thing. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in the next video later.